It's that time again to go around the world of business on Business Incorporated. Good afternoon. It's 55 minutes ahead of us. Here's what's coming your way in 55 minutes. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken kicks off another Mideast crisis tour. It begins today. And in Niger State, in Nigeria, a cost of living protest. Not a common one. We'll delve into that. And Ethiopia bans coffee exports to China. Find out why on the program. You're welcome. I'm Amy John Mekwa. Great to have you here uh, in 55 minutes. Let's go around the world of business, beginning with oil prices. They were steady on Monday following a sharp fall last week after Washington pledged to launch further strikes on Iran-backed groups in the Middle East and strong U.S. job reports dampened hopes of swift rate cuts. Brent's crude features fell 18 cents. That's about 0.2%. To $77.15 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude features were $72.04, and that's down 24 cents, about 0.3%. The U.S. report showed a job growth accelerating in January and wages up by the most in nearly two years. Signs that could complicate interest rate cuts by the U.S. Federal Reserve of Financial Market had uh, and vision that could start in May. The data pushes the timeline for Fed's highly anticipated cutting cycle out into the second quarter, according to people familiar with the matter. In the grain space, now Chicago soybeans ticked high on Monday after dropping to their lowest in more than two years earlier in the session. Although strengthening dollar and lackluster demand for U.S. cargoes limited the upside in prices and corn slid to a one-week low while wheat fell for a second session. The most active soybean contract for the Chicago Board of Trade uh, added 0.2% at $11.90 for three quarter of a bushel after sliding earlier in the session to its lowest since November 2021 at $11.83 a bushel. Corn fell 0.3% to $4.41 for a quarter of a bushel, not far from the weekend since January 30th that it reached earlier on Monday. And wheat lost 0.8% to $5.94 for three quarter of a bushel. Soybean market is facing pressure as the dollar goes up to an eight-week high against its major pairs. On Monday, as traders claw back a bet for aggressive rate cuts by Federal Reserve this year in a view of a still resilient U.S. economy. And talking about economies now, we have uh, something from the OECD. The global economy is on course to hold up better this year than expected only a few months ago as an improved outlook in the United States offsets Eurozone weakness. And it's according to the OECD, world economic growth is expected to ease from 3.1% in 2023 to 2.9% this year, better than the 2.7% in November in the organization for the economic cooperation and development last outlook. In an update of its forecast for major economies, the Paris-based OECD left its 2025 global estimate unchanged at 3% uh, when growth is expected to be boosted by major central banks' rate cuts as inflation pressures subside. The U.S. economy was expected to grow by 2.1% in 2024 and 1.7% in 2025 as lower inflation boosted wage growth and triggers interest rate cuts. The OECD says that raising its 2024 forecast from 1.5% previously and leaving 2025 unchanged as China contends with real estate market wobbles and weak consumer confidence. And then we come to Nigeria. Poultry farmers nationwide in Nigeria say that their members lost more than 3 trillion naira investment from the prevailing economic hardships in the year. This was disclosed by farmers under the aegis of the Poultry Association of Nigeria, the Lagos State Chapter. 
The Lagos State Chapter Chairman, Mr. Mojidi Yola, said that the prevailing harsh economic situation in the country had forced majority of its members to quit the business. And he said that the association lost the amount in revenue following the massive closure of poultry farms by majority of its members who could not meet up with their financial requirements to keep their businesses afloat. According to him, the economic impact of the massive closure of poultry farms in the country since 2023 is enormous. And one of the challenges that poultry farmers are facing is power generation. Now, uh, according to data from the Federal Ministry of Power, the national grid crashed to zero megawatts around 1 p.m. yesterday, Sunday, as the power uh, in the country grid witnessed a national collapse. And data obtained from the Power Ministry show that electricity uh, generation on the grid dropped from 2,407 megawatts around 11.53 to 31. Those visuals actually are from the protests from our next story of what's going on in Niger State in Nigeria uh, early this morning. Mostly women, but uh, a lot of residents in Niger State took to the streets to protest the cost of living. Uh, the Niger State capital was flooded the street uh, to protest that rising cost of living in the state. I must add, not just in Niger State, obviously, uh, it's a common uh, phenomenon in the country, Nigeria as a whole. The crowd, which was mostly women, blocked the Kahungu axis of Mina Bida Road in the Niger State capital, protesting against hunger and high cost of living. The women carrying placards uh, with inscription, no food, we are dying of hunger. They demand a better condition of living and reduction in cost of living for the citizens. They accuse political office holders of insensitivity to their plight, even as they lament inability to feed even once in a day. Let's delve into this uh, now with Mr. Ayo Digi Ebo. Mr. Ebo, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, MD of Optimus by Afroinvest, for joining us. Uh, this afternoon. So does this come as a surprise? Because I don't know if I've reported a protest that is for cost of living. I know I've reported in, in the UK and uh, in Europe, but not in Nigeria. But please correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, thanks. Um, it may look new, but I don't think it's coming as a surprise uh, because if we look at reality of what is happening on ground, uh, people are really suffering. And when you look at, in terms of cost of living, is really high. And the income is not increasing. Production is not increasing. Especially look at the rural areas where health uh, uh, crisis, insecurity, have also have been taking over those areas. That means that the source of their livelihood or income is also being squeezed. And as a result, it's really going to put them in a very, very serious or precarious uh, situation. So what we are seeing is not a surprise. Yeah, this, some might have taken to the streets to protest this, but people are also protesting internally because the resources or the income you earn cannot, cannot be, is no longer sufficient given when you look at the, ex from the exchange rate perspective, from if a uh, food product, food cost pr perspective is no longer sufficient. So there's a need to intensify effort. Yes, government is trying its best to see what they can do to uh, reduce that impact. But there's a need to intensify effort before it gets out of hand. Because what this also leads to, if people cannot feed themselves, it has a very strong correlation with insecurity. And if you don't, if insecurity is high, if we are trying to attract foreign portfolio investors, foreign direct investors, this may also drive them away or make them um, go to countries that have more relaxed environments. I think there's a need to look into this or intensify efforts uh, to look into bringing down inflation. Yes, so um, when we see the crowd, I mean, we're just showing it there. Um, 
what efforts do you think can actually bring soccer to them? Even, I mean, especially at the short term, because a reporter who was there, who covered this, said there was actually no leader. So that sounds like chaos. So if you have leaders, somebody leading the protest, you can talk to them and then they can talk to the crowd and say, okay, uh, the government has promised this, the government has promised that. But in this case, if really there's no leader, nobody uh, championing this, but just a group of people who have gotten so hungry and tired, then how do, what do we give them? Does the government come out to say, let's give you food for five days? You know, what do you see as short-term uh, soccer? So I think, um, well, in assuming we have the correct data, things like this, what the immediate action is to have like palliatives in the immediate, which you should get to them. Because what we currently have, and why we're always careful about talking about palliatives is that we don't have the adequate record, and we're not sure it's getting to those that require them. So if that can be done in the immediate, secondly, insecurity has to be taking care of. Most of these people may be farmers, and if they are not cultivating, what would they sell? How would they earn a living? So these are some of the things that within the medium to long time, if we can also take care of insecurity, that will help. Our infrastructure system also needs to be worked on, because when we talk about food inflation almost at 34%, uh, which is high, is part of what we pay for that is packed into that cost is the inefficiencies. So when you move goods from Kano by road to Lagos, the cost is significantly high than moving it through rail. Half of the, some of those items might have also been damaged. And as a result, you would, the cost would be on the total truck. So if we need to work on those things, if we don't work on those things, I don't think that um, uh, things may get out of hand. This is just from one area of the country. If we look at the reality of things, a lot of Nigerians are suffering, given what has happened within the last two, one or two years. Things are really tough. Cost of energy prices have gone really high. It's becoming unaffordable. Uh, based on the exchange rates, uh, real income is reducing. And even food is becoming unaffordable because the cost of food items are also increasing and the income has continued to shrink on a day-by-day -day basis. So, um, in the midst of dwindled government revenue and, on, and all of that, uh, what do you see, what can be done Beginning with Niger State, but of course we know it's not restricted to Niger State. Perhaps the state government can have a word and things like that. Okay, thanks. I think the first thing is that we should also work on our record keeping in terms of enumeration so that if they are going to, so that palliatives can be sent. One, when you look at economies where palliatives are used, it also it propels demand. So if you are going to if we, it's for short term, it doesn't solve the long term solution. If you are going to give this, um, let's say you distribute funds for them to feed, but you are also working on taking care of that long term solution of ensuring that they can begin to um, pay that for themselves, that will really help. Because what we need now is to propel uh, the demand, create the income so that they, we can also propel demand uh, within the economy. You know, most times when you give out these palliatives, if you are if the demand for rice, for instance, is one million metric tons, but it because there's now more money and people need to eat more, it will increase the demand and they will produce more. As a result, it creates additional employment and it takes more people off the streets. That's how, it, when you look at the value chain, that's how it works. But there's a lot that needs to be done uh, to be able to take care of this. All right, Mr. Ayodejebo, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time this afternoon. Managing Director, Optimus by Afrin Best. Always my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So, of course, we do hope that uh, not just in Niger State, but other state governments wake up to this because um, the risk is that uh, more states will join in when they see it happen in one state so it doesn't turn to chaos. We have, we have not forgotten the 2020 experience 
of NSA. So please, state governments do wake up and do something about this. Now, another area uh, that we have potential on the continent this time, uh, African economies have uh, said to have become or could become a major participant in global supply chains by harnessing their vast resources of materials needed for high technology sectors and their own growing consumer markets. And that's according to the United Nations um, Conference on Trade and Development. I guess that we all know that we have potentials in Nigeria, in Africa, but how do we harness that? Has always been a question, a big question. And we know supply chains encompass the systems and resources needed to develop, produce, and transport goods and services from suppliers to customers. Now, let's uh, find out how we can perhaps accelerate this in the face of uh, so much need and want on the continent. Mr. Adebay Adeleke is the founder of Supply Chain Africa. Good afternoon, Mr. Adeleke. Thank you for your time. No, can you hear me? I can hear you, Mr. Adeleke. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Loud and clear. Yeah, great. So we're talking about um, the potential that Africa has. We know we have the raw materials. It's no longer news. We know that the West... Uh, most likely feeds from us when it comes to raw materials, and yet we are not able to develop and harness those potentials. Now, there's another opportunity, supply chain, uh, uh, I think largely untapped. But share with us, uh, you are overseeing supply chain in some countries on the continent. Share with us your experience of the potential and the level of development that we have at this time. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Yes, uh, African supply chain has been undervalued for quite some time now. And uh, with uh, the advent of African Continental Free Trade Agreement, it has brought to light of the amount of uh, revenue and the amount of value and impact African supply chain in totality of the four states can bring together. But, uh, I mean, since African Continental Free Trade Agreement has been launched, uh, we've seen uh, a lot of improvement, a lot of talks, a lot of energy towards making sure that the trade block within the continent uh, is quite impactful. And I believe that uh, a united Africa under a single trading block is actually, it means a lot for the world. I believe the world's going to benefit from that. Uh, and a healthy African economic landscape benefits everyone. But unfortunately, it's going to take some time because there are certain challenges that kind of enters uh, African supply chain. You know, uh, when you talk about trade, uh, you, if you look at trade as a train, uh, the train tracks that the trade runs on in the supply chain, the movement of goods and services from one location to the other. And uh, for that to happen, uh, the whole continent has to be, there has to be a concerted effort. The whole continent has to be sinking. It's just like being in, uh, in an orchestra. You know, everybody has to play their part. And unfortunately, as you can see, across the Sahel, the sub in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we're having some uh, security challenges. And that in itself is going to put some pushback uh, until we figure out how we're going to navigate through this. Thing. As you can see, over the last uh, few months, uh, actually years now, we've seen uh, we've seen what's going on in Guinea uh, initially, and then we'll see what's going on when I went to Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, and then we have Chad. Uh, but uh, for for Equas, uh, you know, Equas, we've seen what has transpired in the last, uh, uh, you know, seven eight months, uh, you know, and uh, what in the last in the last week now, the three uh, called the Shahel Alliance has come up together, and and and, they, and those three countries actually contribute a lot uh, to African GDP as a whole. So them actually from the alliance and a lot of uh, how. You know, African supply chain, you know, uh, is being operated, is based on geopolitics and it's based on infrastructure run. And, you know, then ECOWAS has been together for since 1975. And they've actually established, and uh, regardless of how you think of the infrastructure, either political or economic, uh, it, it, you know, depending on how you look at it, is that it's weak or strong, but it is an infrastructure. And for them to pull out, it's going to actually shock the system a bit. Uh, and, you know, as as the West African nations is trying to navigate how they're going to you know, move around this and how are some of these nations going to be getting their supply because, you know, you know uh, from Niger, you have uranium, from Mali and Burkina Faso, there's a light deposit of gold over there, which is quite instrumental to a lot of production globally. So, and also within Africa as well, because we cannot produce what we wanted to produce for the rest of the world. We, 
I mean, we we want to be part of the value chain, but uh, the raw materials has to be available for us to be part of the value chain. And for yeah. that to happen, mm. every nation state has to you know play its major role. And if these three guys uh, that are actually part of it and the whole key to one of the you know the minerals that we need in production are kind of bowing out, then we have to look at things uh, differently. And that's one of the issues uh, that is plaguing the, the African supply chain right yeah, now. The yeah, but Mr. Deleke, Mr. Deleke, isn't it, isn't it too soon to start talking about that? Because, I mean, we had these three countries with us all along. What did we do with, you know, what they have? What we saw was that the Western world were coming to exploit it and take it back to their country. I mean, we can't, I don't think we can use that as an excuse now. What have each country, what have we done as, as our own, uh, nation with what we have? How have we um, maximized or even explored, not even maximizing, inter-nations within us, neighboring countries? I, I don't think we can put it on, on those three countries at this no, time. No, I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm not unilaterally uh, unilateral putting it on and what's going on in those states, but it's part of it as well. And you're absolutely right. You know, in single uh, nation state, haven't produced much uh, and do, do because of a lot of internal issues. And for us to be able to produce as Africa, uh, a lot of uh, our systems and infrastructure has to talk in place. Like you can see, for example, we have, you know, Francophone Africa, we have uh, Anglophone Africa, and that in itself is quite problematic because our systems are quite different. The way we do business is quite different. And, uh, you know, our production level differs. Nigeria, for example, is supposed to hit about three. And Nigeria, in evaluation, Nigerian economy in evaluation, has the potential to hit about three trillion, but we've not been able to actually meet our potential because of our own internal issues of security, of lack of productivity, of lack of uh, critical infrastructure that is needed at which supply chain actually runs on. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, our critical infrastructure in most of these countries across Africa is lacking. Uh, our, I mean, our most of the pipelines, most of the, the what you call the the integral pillars of supply chain, logistics, procurement, some of those systems and processes are lacking. And a lot of them are ancient in, in ways that they are not progressive in what is going on in the world. So all these things have to be, an individual state have to critically look into themselves and say, how can I be part of the global economy? Uh, and for that to happen, a lot of this has to be retooled. And these things are not cheap. It's going to take a, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while. But a lot of countries are actually grappling with security issues. Supply chain, uh, infrastructure rebuild is the last on their mind. So, you know, you have to look at Mr. Ayodeji, a boy that came before me talking about, uh, you know, food insecurity, which is a large part of it. I mean, if people cannot eat, they cannot leave. So, you know, addressing agricultural issues and some of those food insecurity issues take priority over certain things in supply chain. So those are the things we have to kind of, uh, you know, grapple with that, especially okay. when we talk about the, uh, the whole continental uh, supply chain at large. All right, Mr. Deleke, just very briefly now, what are some of the opportunities available to individuals or small businesses on the continent in this area of supply chain? Absolutely. So uh, as what we've seen in the last two or three years uh, with some of the data that we've gathered so far is that the world at large needs our our goods. And uh, for the, because of our economy, because of our large uh, so, uh, human capital, we'll be able to produce that load. Uh, we have a huge labor uh, advantage and we'll be able to produce the rest of the world. And I believe until we are getting our internal issues straight, we should be able to at least push to the rest of the world. So there is an opportunity in actually, you know, pushing and exporting a lot of our, our produce. And that in itself is a great opportunity. And second of all, uh, is the ability for, you know, private and public partnership. The government in itself, uh, as in Africa, we always turn to government for everything. We turn government into God. But actually, the, the, the nation building and building of supply chain infrastructures that can uh, help us, uh, uh, you know, to pull all these things together requires both the private uh, and the public sector to come together to be able to show the knowledge, know-how, and be able to build. So opportunities uh, are bearing for infrastructure build across different nations, at least the West African, which I'm, I'm most, uh, uh, I'm most kind of, you know, uh, I'm, I'm most, uh, you know, uh, that I know more about, you know. So all these things have to, it, it provides a huge opportunity, infrastructure. Build, and we've seen a lot of organizations coming together with the government to build this infrastructure, road, rail, water, and be able to, you know, open up those pipelines to move uh, goods and services and move agricultural products from place of abundance right. to place 
of scarcity. All right, Mr. Adeleke, thank you so much for sharing those tips with us. We really thank do so appreciate it, Mr. Deboy Adeleke. is the founder of Supply Chain Africa. Enjoy the rest of your day. back to watching business incorporated right here on channels television and head over to the markets now with will ibong will good afternoon nini afternoon i see you have good news for us oh yes we do have good news right. the ngx is i think is blind and deaf to what's happening in the country but hopefully it is still moving blind to the cost of living protests yes it's blind blind to, to the inflation and, and food to inflation. inflation but we don't know how sustainable i don't know, I don't know if that's how good, long <laughs> i don't even know if this is a good thing you know because normally they would say that the market the the Equities stock market is a barometer is the of, of, the of the economy, economy. and we see the economy going one way and i guess it can only happen in nigeria someone did describe it. Someone analyst did describe it as a stockfish <laughs> oh no i don't want, i saw that I didn't <laughs> it was just great well we're going to see where it's headed you know hopefully there's some fundamentals some things analysts and investors are seeing that are keeping the market going despite in spite the, of the, everything the downtrends that we see right. in the economy so we're just going to kick off with first trading day of the week with the market sentiment from Africa, where we see major equities were mostly positive at intraday. Nigeria's NGX all share index was up 0.35% at intraday, still holding on to 104,000 uh, points there. And early flyers, we've seen early flyers, um, and this is probably based on, you know, companies filing in their audited and audited earnings reports. And I can say so far, so good. Now we're looking at South Africa now on the flip side, it was flat at intraday, 0.0%. Uh, now let's look at Egypt, shall we? Let's see how the EGX 30 fed at intraday. It was up 0.34%. Uh, we've also seen that com news coming from the IMF on Thursday that has agreed with Egypt on the key policy components of an economic reform program. And this is for the sign that a final deal to increase the country's $3 billion loan is nearing completion. Now, while we saw a positive uh, close on Friday for Nairobi Stock Exchange, up 0.5%. Now, let's get a deeper sense of what's coming happening in the markets here in Nigeria, especially in the economy. And we are joined virtually by Mr. Pabina Yenkere, is the business head, asset management, Norin Berger. Good afternoon, sir. It's good to have you. So last week, the Central Bank of Nigeria, we had a flurry of, you know, notice, publications, I say, <laughs> public notices from the Central Bank of Nigeria. Circulars, you know, it was really, the market was saturated with the circulars and in terms of its FX policies and other things like that. And he said, one of the things they said is it was, it was stopping daily cash reserve ratio that CRL debits for commercial banks. Uh, could you tell us what are the possible implications of this decision on the stability of the financial system in the country and what signal does it send to the markets? Okay, thank you for having me. I hope I'm audible enough. Yes, great. So um, if, you, if we cast our mind back, uh, the CPN under the previous regime, under the regime of the previous uh, governor, Governor uh, MFLA, um, had to deploy a lot of unorthodox economic, you know, unorthodox monetary policy measures to deal with the issues that Nigeria was facing uh, at, at that time, particularly driven by COVID and the post-COVID years and the prior FX challenges that we've had earlier than that. We have to deploy a lot of unorthodox um, monetary policy. Part of this unorthodox monetary policy um, involve the CRR debits, discretionary CRR debits that we've seen um, happening with banks. Um, one of the complaints from banks uh, with regard to these da daily CRR debits was that it affected the ability to be able to lend, basically. Um, because what happens is that for every 
cash that comes in every day, you are being slammed for it. So it was a disincentive for banks to, to want to lend. It was quite strenuous, quite aggressive. Uh, many banks were reporting effective CRR debit rates that were far higher than the minimum uh, 32.5% that, that the CBN has set. Um, we had banks reporting as much as 50, even some of them nearly 60% effective CRR debit rate. So um, in a nutshell, this really affected banks' ability to be able to lend. But what we are seeing with the new CBN regime is a plan and a target towards returning Nigeria's monetary system back to um, orthodoxy, right? So um, as you can see, this rollout of many, uh, many circulars coming out of, of the central bank last week is all in a bid to ensure that we realign back to an orthodox monetary policy system. And if you look at the CRR debit um, circular that came out, what it seems to do is to enable banks and lessen that burden of daily CRR debit so that it can create an avenue for banks to one, go back to their effect to, to, to what their real CRR rate should be, 32.5% um, on the first instance. They have taken some moves around this earlier in 2023. But now what they're going to do is to even smoothen out that process better and gives banks an opportunity to be able to re you know, really, really lend uh, to the economy. I think it's a good positive signal for banks that this is coming out because it gives them the ammunition to be able to um, um, serve that purpose of intermediary in, in the economy. I, I think it's very vital that I, we do that. I, but on the other hand, it has also, while it has released the carrot, it has also thrown, you know, wielding the stick because uh, part of this CRR um, communique is that banks that are failing to meet up with a minimum loan to deposit ratio of 65% um, would have to uh, suffer a heavier CRR debit on the portion that is you know, not meeting up to the to the to the loan to deposit ratio. So mm. a bit of a carrot can stick up with you, but I think it's all in the right direction. Uh, if you want banks to lend, you need to give them the opportunity to do that lending and at the same time also create a, a disincentive or rather an incentive. Uh, if you will, to want to uh, get banks to lend. So, so these are the, uh, I think they are positive developments. That's a very good. I do like that term you used there, an ammunition to the market. But is it going to be a positive ammunition for inflationary? Is it going to stoke inflation further than it already is? The pressure is already much for that rate right now. So what do you see more liquidity coming to the system doing to inflation? I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say more liquidity because um, one of the impacts of this you would expect again is that we should expect a tighter monetary policy um, posture by the central bank. So I think from that perspective, we should be able to curb whatever inflationary impact uh, could come through. Okay. Um, if you recall, because of this aggressive CRR debit stance, uh, many banks were unwilling to take deposits from, from depositors. And even when they did, they sort of like priced it lower, you know? So um, I think one of the first things that will follow through with this is that interest rates would have to rise, um, which uh, at this point in time uh, is the CBS leaning. Uh, it had said earlier that it wants to um, start looking at targeting inflation. So all of these moves we are seeing is a deliberate step towards, um, towards creating a tighter monetary system, but at the same time, a monetary system that still allows the economy to function. Uh, but I don't think inflation would be uh, the main concern at this point. If anything, it helps to even uh, fight inflation because if you have a tighter system, it means less Naira uh, in the system, which is, which is a good way to fight inflation, yeah, with higher rates. Uh, I was going to talk about the impact that would have on the interest rate, but you mentioned that it's going to go higher, which is a good thing for the markets. But let's look at some of the stories that are coming through the weekend that we see global ratings company, credit ratings company, S&P Global, as a firm Nigeria's credit outlook. I think it's bouncing off the fact that the CBN had some incredible policies. Well, you said that is in a positive direction which is one of the reasons they cited. And it said that our uh, outlook will remain stable in 2024, but the short-term foreign and local currency sovereign credit worthiness is still at B minus B, while the long-term, that's the national rating, suspect that triple B, and we do know that it's not. Even though its investment grade is still the bottom tier of that, you know, the site is still saying it's, we should look, investors should still look with caution, 
at our credit worthiness. Um, what do you think? How do you think this is going to affect? Um, how do you think this is going to affect the government's reform agenda against the possible risks such as inflation, as I mentioned, and you know the volatile currency that we're we're experiencing? Okay, I, I don't think the affirmation of the credit rating really, really changes a lot in the Nigeria picture today. Uh, and I'll say why. Um, if you if you look at what has happened, I think for international investors, the relevant rate here is the is the foreign currency credit rating, which is which is still a B B minus, and that didn't change. So it didn't, doesn't really change Nigeria's stance, you know, um, as a as a credit uh, a counterparty. Uh, on the on the domestic front, um, I'm a little concerned. Uh, at what metrics um, the, the rating agency has used. Because if you recall, any a government in its local currency is the most credit-worthy organization or credit-worthy body in its own local currency. And that's driven by the fact that it is the only institution that has the power to print money. It's the only institution that has the power to raise taxes. So um, I, would have, I would imagine uh, that if we look through um, rating agents, rating credit ratings across most countries, you'll find that the domestic um, long-term and short-term credit rating should be AAA uh, because of that factor. So uh, we we'll need to look a lot more at, at the at, at what the what the uh, credit rating agency is looking at when they issue the triple B rating for for our local currency. Um, I, I'm, I'm not so very convinced that um, I think our credit rating should be. Uh, at most triple triple A um, for 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 Nigeria's local currency. Um, like I mentioned before, the government is the only party that can do those things to deal with um, how it repays its debt, and basically in the local economy. So I, I guess that's how I'd like to leave it there. Um, but for the terms of how it affects our overall reforms, how it affects our overall view to attract investors, I don't think anything has changed. People know where Nigeria is today. They know what the challenges are. Um, and we can see that some of these reforms have kick-started when this new government entered. We've had reforms in, uh, in, in the fuel subsidy. We've had reforms in and around the currency, which continues to happen. Um, it was never going to be a simple solution for Nigeria. Um, we all knew that whatever government coming in would have to make some tough decisions. And those tough decisions have happened. The, the country is living with it, but... I tell you, um, a lot of people are crying out. We did hear um, your, your guest earlier, your DG, Abel, speaking about um, the food crisis. Uh, we should expect to see a lot more agitation towards the cost of, of living. So the government really needs to do something quickly uh, to address the economic situation in Nigeria. But it was, it was never going to be a short-term fix. Um, Long-term solutions are needed. Uh, we need to see more. Um, deliberate steps by the government to really boost production. I think that's one of the areas we really need to focus on, boosting local production, mm. because that's how you get economies going. You okay. know? Um, so, tough Thank road uh, for us as economy, okay. but I think we've taken the first two important steps, which is okay. relieving the government of this burden of subsidy and trying to position the company, the country, okay. as an investment-friendly and investment-willing uh, 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 country or heaven, if you put it that way. Thank, Thank you so much, I mean, Mr. Pabina Yinkere, Business Head, Asset Management, uh, Norange Berger, for sharing your insights on Business Incorporated. Thank you for having me. So we'll have a quick look at what's happening in the Middle East. We saw mixed sentiments coming from that region for major equities. So that's at intraday. Abu Dhabi was down 0.17%. We saw Dubai on the flip side. Flat, 0.0%. Uh, uh, now, still within the region, we see Qatari index up 0.67%. Uh, I mean, the Saudi uh, index up 0.67%, while the Qatari index was down 1.52% at intraday. Now, look very quickly at the U.S. markets. We're seeing it higher early on Monday. After slipping slightly, the rebound is coming from the U.S. Federal Reserve's, uh, that's uh, Jerome Powell, saying that he's not ready to cut interest rates in the near term. He might not be cutting interest rates. So, so futures tied to those uh, Futures, I mean, so those indexes were up at intraday 0.35% of 1.07% for the SP futures, and NASDAQ futures was up 1.74%. Now, this move comes out of the three major averages rose for the 13th week out of 14, and that's powered by stronger than expected January jobs report and solid earnings reports from Microsoft and Meta platforms. And Meta also released its first ever dividend last week. Now, the gains 
even come, even though the Federal Reserve said Wednesday that the central bank would not cut interest rates in March, some traders had been speculating that this was going to happen and that has dented some of the hopes there. So looking at the Asian markets, that's a bit red in that region. Only the Japan the Nikkei 225 we saw up 0.54 percent, and um, uh, uh, um, any the, the Asia markets are going to be going on holiday for the New Year's, the New Year's holiday. So they're going to have a short holiday, shortened trading week this week. Yeah, and uh, they're already in trouble anyway with the Evergrande and all of that. But thank you so much, Ria. All right, let's head to London and have Juliana join us. Hi, Juliana. Happy Monday to you. Um, but at least we come with, I think, some good news from your service sector there, posting fastest growth in eight months. Uh, who are the contributors to this? Good afternoon, Ili. Yeah, really positive news from the S&P Global Index today, looking at the UK's all-important services sector. It's very important, of course, because it contributes more than 80% uh, to our economic output, and this involves all sorts of services, including financial and medical, retail, and most importantly, hospitality. So I think economists have been really um, perked by the data coming out this morning because it does show that uh, there has been an increase since what we was recording in December. I believe the December data came in at 53.4, which was still well above uh, the benchmark rate of 50. So anything that comes in above 50 shows um, that that particular sector has expanded. Anything below, of course, is contraction. Now, I think economists have priced in about a 53.8. So 54.8 is well above um, estimates. And I think a lot of this is down to solid inflows and faster hiring. So it's the UK labour market uh, that is in full force, um, which does two things, because on the one hand, that's good, of course, we need more people in the labour market. The more people who are working, of course, that boosts Britain's economic output. But then again, if we go back to uh, Thursday, the Monetary Policy Committee gathering at Threadneedle Street. One of the reasons why uh, Hugh Pill, the chief economist at the Bank of England, um, spoke about the, the, the central bank governor not being so keen um, to start pausing interest rate hikes or even bringing it down is because of inflated wages. Of course, if more people are working, people want more more money in their back pocket um, and that's because most people are having to pick up the slack of others so that is a concern um, but I think of course it is positive news showing uh, that the UK's all-important service industry is picking up in January which is typically um, a very uh, slow month and I, I think it kind of contrasts uh, some of the mood music we're getting from the OECD um, they've been speaking this morning which is the Paris Bank Pact backed think tank um, about some of the big elections coming up this year and how that is going to shape economies, namely, of course, we've got the big one um, in America, but we've also got a ballot here. And last week, we did have more warnings from the IMF to the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, basically saying in order uh, for the UK's economy to grow, you need to focus less on tax cutting measures and more about investing in public um, services. So this is all culminating into what is going to be in what is likely to be the latest fiscal event, the last fiscal event on this cons from this Conservative government, which is um, Jeremy Hunt's spring budget, which we're all um, on tenterhooks waiting for. Yeah, another good news is that uh, jobless rate is lower than expected, I must say. Good news coming from the UK this Monday. Yeah, that's absolutely right. We have had revised data from the Office of National Statistics looking at the quarter to November of the UK's unemployment rate. Now, it has always been, even throughout COVID, historically and internationally low. So I think before the revision, um, the three months to November, UK unemployment was down at about 4.3%. Uh, but alas, they've come out this morning uh, with a revised um, figure showing that UK unemployment was actually much lower at 3.9%. And there are several factors um, which have contributed to that, namely being um, the fact that the ONS have re-looked at their modelling figures. In fact, they've had to do that across a wide range 
um, of data services, but particularly with um, the labour market, because of course this is just a survey. They've not looked at every single individual in Britain and asked them whether or not you're working or not, but they've decided to add a lot more women and a lot more young people into the survey, uh, which has led to this revised figure. So in a way, yes, it is a good thing that we've got more than <laughs> 75% of people in the UK in work, I believe about 21%, or it could be quite much higher, um, who are currently inactive. But it is good. It shows that, you know, people are out there and earning a living. But again, going back to what I was saying about the Bank of England, the headache for Governor Andrew Bailey is, what do we do about interest rates when we can see that the more people who are in work, the, the more wages are being demanded? And we know that one of the reasons why inflation has been so stubbornly high is because of wages. People are demanding more. And when you have more money in your back pocket, you spend more and demand goes up. So I think Bank of England watching this labour market data incredibly carefully uh, because until they have a firm um, idea of what the UK labour market is like and is going to be, then it is going to be really difficult for them to move on interest rates, which are at 5.25%, incredibly high. It costs a lot of money to borrow, which is why there's just a large swathe of businesses in the UK really struggling at the moment uh, because before they could use cheap borrowing to kind of paste over the cracks. They just not able to do that at this time yeah and uh, the pound too is uh, feeling part of it although in this case is because the dollar is strengthening yeah you're absolutely right about that i don't have uh, the live uh, pound data at the moment but from what i've just had a glimpse of it does show that yes the the, the british pound is trading down against the us dollar by a quarter which is pretty high at 0.5 percent uh, 0.25 percent uh, but it's also it's trading up against the euro by 0.01 percent but so by a smidging uh, but the british pound is trading down against the japanese yen at intraday by a quarter of a percent the all share though is up the uk blue chip index it, typically of course because the FTSE 100 has so many internationally focused um, firms when the pound is down they tend to do well which is the case at intraday uh, the blue chip the FTSE 100 also up by 0.14% in it, but the FTSE 250, um, the uh, domestic market, that is trading lower, but still up at 0.10%. Ah, so at the end of the day, it's uh, mixed right there from the UK. More good news, I hope. Well, thank you so much, Juliana. Let's move to Europe now. We talked about supply chain in Africa. Now we'll talk about EU supply chain, uh, the law of supply chain, uh, which would punish European firms for human rights and environmental violations, is in doubt because it doesn't have the support of the German government. Well, let's find out more about this with Chief Chiponda Chimbelu. been a wild Chief. Uh, good afternoon. Good to have you on the show. Having me any well, one of the reasons the German government is opposed to this EU law is because of a disagreement within the ruling coalition. While the Social Democrats support it, one of their coalition partners, the Free Democrats, do not. They say the EU law would hurt German businesses. Germany already has a supply chain law, but the EU law would go further than the German one. It would mean that more companies would have to adhere to the supply chain rules, including firms with fewer than 1,000 employees. Now, so far, they have been excluded from Germany's supply chain law. Critics of the EU law within the German government say that many smaller and medium-sized companies do not have the necessary personnel and financial resources to deal with the EU law. All right, thanks, Chip. Let's head to the market, see what investors are doing at this time. Well, European markets are expected to trade lower, Ine. Here in Germany, there's been more bad news on the economy. Exports fell more than expected in December due to weak global demand. And of course, that's not the only cause for concern for investment investors. They have also been watching developments in China where stocks were in a volatile session. And they're trying to figure out what Chinese regulators mean when they say that they vow to stabilize the markets. Investors are also, of course, looking at interest rates uh, in the U.S. A robust U.S. jobs report last Friday has dashed hopes that the U.S. central bank could cut rates. Now, traders had initially priced in March as the starting point of the Fed's easing cycle. But any, that seems highly unlikely. Mm, highly like unlikely. Thank you so much, Chip. Enjoy the rest of your day. 
Uh, let's uh, see what's happening in other parts of the continent, uh, Africa, I mean. Uh, we're starting with the United States Secretary of State. As we speak, he's, uh, that's Mr. Anthony Blinken. He's kicked off another Mideast uh, crisis tour today in a bid to secure a new trance in the Israel-Hamas war. A southern Gaza saw no let-up in fighting on this fifth trip to the region since Hamas' October 7 attack that triggered the war, Mr. Blinken is expected to visit Saudi Arabia, Israel, Egypt, and Qatar. Ahead of the trip, he stressed the need for urgently addressing humanitarian needs in Gaza after uh, aid groups have repeatedly sounded the alarm over the devastating impact on the besieged territory. And then from there, we move to Zimbabwe, where the European Union has renewed its restrictions on Zimbabwe, dealing a major blow to President Emerson Wagaga and his administration's re-engagement bid. According to a statement issued by the Council of the EU, sanctions on the country will stretch until February 20th, 2025. The EU also maintained targeted sanctions on the Zimbabwean defense industries who hope to have a conversation on this, on what exactly it means and the sectors that are most affected. And so we go to um, Ethiopia, where Ethiopian Coffee and Tea Authority has implemented a ban on uh, Chinese coffee companies from entering into contracts, citing their failure to make payments to coffee exporters and resulting in the loss of foreign currency earnings for the country, that's Ethiopia. Ethiopia, uh, coffee has played a significant role in the rapid growth of China's economy. As a result, both foreign and domestic organizations have shown great interest in engaging with the sector. And I know it's no longer news about that postponement of the presidential election in Senegal. In reaction to that, euro bonds of that country fell sharply after the president, Macky Sall, postponed this month's presidential election. And as lawmakers gathered to consider extending his mandate until the successor takes power. Uh, we've so, uh, seen police reinforcement security in the capital this morning, uh, Monday, after clashes with opposition supporters. The euro bond maturing in 2020, 2033 dropped 3.9% on the dollar. Uh, that's its lowest in more than two months as investors price in limited risk premium. Another unfortunate story coming from the African continent right there. Democracy was our definition, but maybe Laddie Williams may have that definition uh, looking <laughs> at his script. Now, I right. don't know, Laddie, but you know, sometimes on the continent, I mean, a pres there was supposed to be a presidential election, right. and then the president postpones it. And obviously, investors, uh, investors get the jitters. definitely react. Yeah, you now know, see, see what has happened to their euro bond. You know, with their bonds at this time. That's why you need to keep on with the time, yeah. whatever you say, because investors are watching. Let's <laughs> look at the crypto market. You know? Tell that to real, Ibon. <laughs> at this time. All right, let's uh, take a look at the color of the market. Um, right now, we see um, Bitcoin. We're seeing some buying uh, interest, you know, at this time. If you see, it's a uh, mixed uh, color there. Uh, but the dominant color is still some red, you know, at this point. And we have uh, some pockets of green. Let's bring in Emmanuel Anyasi now, uh, crypto uh, influencer and uh, trader join us via Zoom. Great to have you on the show. Well, thank you, Lani. Fantastic. Yeah, so uh, looking at the, the market now, we're still seeing Bitcoin still managing to hold above, you know, 40,000, still at 43,000. Post uh, Bitcoin spot ETF approval, is this the price uh, investors were expecting? Well, um, before um, the, um, like, like you say in the market, people tend to say, people tend to say the news. Like, um, we've had this um, ETF, uh, spot ETF um, approval being rejected many times before it finally got approved um, last, last year. Um, so, um, we actually expected um, so many uh, people actually holding some bags. Uh, we actually expected in 2021 to actually offload some of their bags. Uh, so Grayscale has, um, has been one of the biggest holders of Bitcoin. Uh, so we've seen them actually offloading some of the bags um, uh, to the investors um, who actually bought the GBTC. And um, I, I think the market um, has actually recovered from those kind of dumps. Um, 
Uh, we saw huge volume after the spot safety eventually got passed, which is actually a very good boost. We saw market like it traded more than any ETF that actually listed um, in the US. So um, I'm very optimistic. According to my charts, um, I'm very, very positive that we actually we, we actually get to $51,000 um, $51, um, per year. Uh, but if if um, the previous high, which is around forty-eight, um, this thing, uh, forty-nine thousand is actually our high, then we actually get to forty-five thousand, or we actually we visit forty-eight thousand. But for me, I'm actually very bullish because um, the volume coming in from the sports ETF is actually a great thing. If we can actually absorb all the all the dumps that are actually happening, and um, we actually dump to like forty k, um, then we are actually back to. We don't to like forty um to like um thirty seven thousand, yes. Uh thirty seven thousand, we actually buy at forty three thousand. And um from our technical analysis perspective, if you look at the chart, you see that good buys are actually coming in. I'm expecting to see um oh certainly we see this new uh, this forty eight um forty nine thousand, this forty eight eight hundred, or we actually go higher to for fifty one um okay. um five hundred, which was which it was which is another um resistance zone right so definitely I'm very yeah I so actually move up. yeah we'll definitely be watching out for those uh, uh price movement those resistance zones that you actually mentioned and um definitely is looking quite bullish at this time thank you so much um emmanuel nyasi uh crypto influence and trader thank you so much okay thank you all right so um Inie, there you have it he's quite optimistic about yeah. uh the the price of uh, bitcoin going higher but definitely, we know there is some downside risk at the end of They'll the day. It's a brand new week at this point. <laughs> There'll always be pullback somewhere. But thank you so much, uh, Ladi. Thank you. All right, so that's it uh, on the program this very first day of the week. Ah, been a race. I hope it's been worth it. Please remember, you can always watch this program every time you want on our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com. Our first like channels web. Uh, you look for business morning for the 10 a.m. or for business incorporated and you have to relieve this moment uh, again. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you tomorrow. That's race.